Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, talk with you all uh, today. Um, hopefully we've got a little rain. I'm in Bernie, Texas, and we got a little bit of rain yesterday and hopefully a little more today. So hopefully you've got a little bit coming down there too at some point throughout the day. Um, today, uh, this is a presentation that I've given uh, a few times now. We have uh, um, uh, tried to do a lot of restoration work in our yard. Uh, here in Bernie uh, to try to reintroduce uh, wildlife, if you will, create habitat. Uh, it is a small yard, as you're going to see in the pictures, but I wanted to share with, with you today what we've done, talk to you a lot about um, what kind of plants you can consider, what kind of animals you might uh, result, or might end up being here uh, as a result of your efforts and those kinds of things. And then also just be able to, to answer questions, because first of all, not everything goes according to plan. And uh, a lot of times people say, uh, well, you know, if you use native plants and the gardening is really easy and it turns out it's not. Um, uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, something that uh, if somebody tells you that, don't believe them. Uh, because anything uh, in nature taken out of its normal com competition become, can become a weed. So keep that in mind. Uh, but I've got a lot to share with you today. I, I'm going to talk to you about the Texas Nature Trackers program. Uh, that, that I am part of with Texas Parks and Wildlife. So we're gonna start off with that. And in terms of an agenda for today, uh, we'll talk about uh, what I do and, and how we use iNaturalist to help us and actually how you can use iNaturalist. It would be very brief on, on that. Uh, we're gonna talk about just considerations to think about if you're thinking about doing some habitat restoration on your, on your property. Um, and then the whole process that I, uh, we have gone through and continue to go through um, and then kind of the results, what, what's happening out there as a result of those efforts, because, you know, it's one thing to do something, but then it's another thing to follow up and to say, well, did it have any impact? So we want to make sure we share that with you. Um, and then also go through, a, take a little bit of time and kind of share with you some of the pollinator plants that we've used that on all of these plants are going to be found in your area. Um, and so uh, they, and they do focus on native plants and then talk a little bit briefly about resources. There's lots of stuff out there now, uh, resource wise for you to investigate and learn about um, and then uh, give you a chance for those final questions at the end. And I will break a couple of times, one after we get done with the Texas Nature Trackers iNaturalist thing in case you have any questions about iNaturalist. Uh, because I'm, like I say, it's not a full blown, we normally give, you know, one to, four hour presentations on iNaturals. So this is gonna be pretty short by comparison. Um, and then uh, we'll take a break actually before we get into the pollinator plants as well. So um, uh, again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation to, to speak to your group and uh, let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, um, uh, I should let you know that um, uh, we are part of Texas, I've worked for Texas Parks and Wildlife have for a number of years now. Uh, I started out with Texas Parks and Wildlife at Guadalupe River State Park, uh, serving as an interpretive naturalist. I've been mostly a educator, naturalist, uh, interpreter, whatever you want to use, whatever term you want to use for over 30 years, uh, from Minnesota down here to Texas. I worked at the park for nine years and uh, then moved into the wildlife division three years ago. Uh, and this job two years ago now. Um, but I am part of what's known as the Community Stewardship and Engagement Team. It's a member of four, four person uh, group. Uh, my boss is the head of uh, all of Texas Master Naturalists across the state of Texas, which is 15,000 people plus strong. Um, if you haven't heard of Texas Master Naturalists, uh, throw me a question. I can tell you a little bit about that. Um, but it's a wonderful program of volunteers uh, going out and doing a lot of things to um, uh, make a, a difference in the world in terms of the natural history uh, and education of our state. Um, but we have myself, Tanya Homayoun, who uh, works out of Austin uh, and uh, is also a Texas Nature Trackers biologist. We have our fourth team member is Olivia Hahn, who is our outreach specialist, make, produces amazing videos and and content for uh, sharing out with the state of Texas. So pretty, pretty uh, powerful uh, bit of work that she does with us. And basically we are part of the Texas Parks and Wildlife, Wildlife Diversity Program, which is part of the Wildlife Division of Texas Parks and Wildlife. And we help track the status of wild populations of plants and animals across Texas. And a lot of what we do is doing this kind of work, outreach to the general public to try to get community 
citizen scientists interested in participating in uh, conservation, in documenting what's going out, on out there. Uh, one of the things I tell people is that um, every county in the state of Texas has one Texas Parks and Wildlife biologist assigned to it. Um, and a lot of those biologists have multiple counties. As a result of that, there's no way possible that they can keep track of all the flora and fauna of their area. And that's where citizen or community scientists come in that can help with that. And a really powerful tool for doing that is iNaturalist, which I'll introduce you here to, uh, uh, momentarily. Uh, the other thing is by your getting involved, uh, whether it's through the Friends of the Balconies or, um, um, or Master Naturalist or whatever group you, you are a part of, uh, it's a great, great way for you to learn more. Um, about the biodiversity of the state of Texas, which is tremendously diverse. And then also by contributing information, you also allow us to help with conservation efforts across the state of Texas. And as I like to say, if you don't know what you don't know, how can you manage anything? So the more we know, the more we understand, the better it is for us in order to make good, wise conservation related decisions in terms of management of our natural resources. We do have a, uh, 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 Texas Nature Trackers does have a public uh, presence on both Facebook and Instagram. On our Facebook page, we, we share a lot of uh, interesting articles and also photographs of research that we're doing in the field or uh, photos of different things. We have a thing called Photo Friday. We always put something up on that and then just sharing a lot of information. We also do uh, what are called TNT Live from the Field um, basically virtual nature walks. Uh, we just started back when COVID shut us all down and due to the popularity, um, it has continued. So we uh, do these a couple of times a month now, typically on Saturday mornings, but try to, to uh, take people out for a virtual nature walk and, and teach them about the natural world and what's around them and what they can find on their own as well. And then of course our Instagram page, uh, Tanya runs the Instagram page, does an excellent job. If you get a chance to, to if you do Instagram, I'm, I'm not a big Instagram user myself, um, but we have a great page. And if you get a chance, make sure you check out this post, this recent post. It is, uh, it's played to the tune of Lionel Richie's song, Hello. Uh, you may, some of you may remember that. And uh, just watch that because it's classic. It's good classic stuff. So again, we post good content on there, try to engage people of a lot of times of a younger uh, age range to uh, get involved in the natural world. So what we do, we actually then reach out to the, to the naturalist community. We use the tool iNaturalist, a, a tool that we did not uh, invent. Some graduate students in California did several years ago. Uh, but it's a great way to track wildlife, both plants and animals. We take, we have projects that we have started and initiated so that data can come into those projects via iNaturalist. We take that information, vet it uh, by curating the, the records. And then the ultimate reason for that is we wanna take good data um, on those records and move them to the research and conservation community. Uh, part of which is uh, to go into the Texas Na Natural Diversity Database. What the Natural Diversity Database is, is a database that has all unique records of animals and plants that are known as SGCNs. These are plants and animals, as I'm going to show you here. We'll just go straight to it. Species of Greatest Conservation Need, SGCN, is a native plant or animal that is declining or rare and in need of attention to recover or to prevent the need to list under state or federal regulation. And one of the challenges, and so, so ultimately these SGCNs can become threatened or endangered species. Uh, the goal is to not allow them to get to that point. I think out in the public, a lot of times people think that conservation agencies are always trying to get everything put on the endangered species list so that you can't do anything to your land, things like that. It's actually quite the opposite. The goal is to never, if, if we could, in our ultimate world, there would be no S, uh, SGCN. Uh, there literally would be none of them that would be of concern, but of course that's not the reality. Um, so the idea is to identify populations of plants and animals that are in decline for whatever reason, and there's lots of reasons, Some, many of them man-made, others just the way it is, um, other things that happen in the natural world. 
Um, the idea is to identify those early enough so that we can take steps in terms of conservation so that they don't get considered for being listed as threatened or endangered species. In your area, the classic example is the golden cheek warbler. Um, and of course, the golden cheek warbler, for some, is a very controversial, beautiful bird. I do like to remind people, um, I'm not from Texas. Um, I've been here for quite a while now, but I'm not from Texas. But I always like to remind people that forget about uh, and, 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 and uh, downplay the golden cheek warbler. Golden cheek warbler is a Texas native, without a doubt, even before the state of Texas existed. So this is the only place in the world where this bird exists. So what we do to the landscape here influences obviously the, the, the uh, how successful that bird's going to be going down the road. But just to show you what can happen, the bald eagle used to be an endangered species, a threatened species across the country and in Texas. It's now been delisted because we've taken good conservation practices to help that bird out. Most recently, another bird that's in the Balcones area is the, is the black uh, cap vireo. It's a bird that has now been delisted. It's no longer a threatened species. Uh, because its population has recovered based on good conservation. So the idea is that if you can identify these things, we can help uh, to make sure we reverse the trend and uh, they, come, they come back. And who are they? They're over 1,300 or around 1,300 in Texas. A lot of them are invertebrates, uh, but the ones that are more uh, common, more popular include these few examples right here. Uh, the whooping crane, you all are familiar with the whooping crane. One of the things we're doing here in Texas, we all know where they go for the winter time. One of the things we're trying to figure out is how do they get from Canada through Texas to the Gulf Coast for the winter? So tracking them through their migratory um, movements, both south and north through Texas, very, very significant and important. And of course, you have the oscillate down here that's down in the valley. Uh, you got the Houston toad to the east of you. Everybody knows the Texas horned lizard and in large parts of Texas, um, the Texas horned horn, horn lizard has disappeared completely. There are lots of restoration efforts on that. So that's an animal that, uh, of course, very iconic here in the state of Texas. And even things like the bobwhite has been a long-term effort to try to resolve uh, uh, issues with their population levels. And a bird that we're actually, Tanya and I are actually working with master naturalist volunteers um, and park officials over in Round Rock at Old Settlers Park is the loggerhead shrike. This is a bird that has been declining throughout its range. It happens to have, uh, uh, believe it or not, if you've ever been to Round Rock uh, and the, the uh, Old Settlers Park, very much a recreation park. You would not think of, look at that and go, well, this is a great bird conservation area. Turns out for this bird and several others, it actually is. Uh, the habitat is absolutely perfect for this bird. So we're doing a long-term uh, nest monitoring study. We're actually color banding the birds, uh, as you'll see here in a moment, uh, to, to try to figure out how they're doing there and how we can move what's successful there to other areas where they might not be doing as well. All right. So we have a program called Texas Nature Trackers, of course. Um, we have our own web page. There are three links when you get to our web page very quickly. There's the projects. I'm going to show you those. We have target species. So if you were interested in finding out well, what species around here, around where you live, are of interest to Texas Parks and Wildlife, that will help you out with that. And then get involved leads you to uh, how to use iNaturalist, getting into iNaturalist and going from there. But our projects, we, we have 12 projects that we work on. Um, and um, uh, Paul, I want to let you know, I'm seeing a thing here that two people are in the waiting room. I don't know if you're able to see that with me presenting or not. Um, but just let me know if I need to let them in or something. Um, so Herps of Texas is one of our uh, most popular programs. There's not a lot of funding out there for understanding reptiles and amphibian populations. This project has given us thousands, literally thousands of records from community scientists to better understand the populations of our, our amphibians and, and reptiles across the state. Of course, mammals of Texas, birds of Texas, you'd expect that probably, rare plants of Texas, bees and wasps. Um, a lot of people have uh, noted, and there's a lot of research showing that populations of bees and wasps are declining across uh, the globe. And so that's real important because without bees as pollinators, we don't have much food in the grocery store. So 
uh, at least as it works today. So that's important. And then we have these other smaller projects, even monitoring milkweeds across the state, the Texas Whooper Watch. And we're not tracking eagles, we're actually tracking eagle nests now to uh, document how uh, to make sure that they're continuing to be successful. So how would you get involved? How would you do that? You could do this tool called iNaturalist. If you were in person, I'd want to show a hands, see how many of you are actually using iNaturalist right now. Um, I tell people, if you've never heard of it, it is walking around with an, a nature encyclopedia in your cell phone. Uh, it truly is. What it does is you go out, you download it. Let me see here if we can get to it. First of all, what it is, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I uh, get too excited about it. Uh, is, it's an online social network that was created by some graduate students to share biodiversity information to help each other learn about nature. They have two goals. The people that develop this um, is to connect people to nature and then also to generate that scientifically valuable biodiversity data that can be shared out across the globe. And it really has been so successful that they're, they're kind of straining at the at the, uh, uh, the, the edges of trying to figure out how to uh, continue successfully with all of the uh, interest that there is on this. So how it works basically is you download the free app, uh, you create an account with a name and a, and a user, a password, and then you go out and you start taking pictures of nature, whether it's a plant or an animal or a caterpillar like you see there. You, uh, the, the app itself will help you to actually identify that it's not 100%, don't expect it to be, but it's pretty darn good. Um, and if it doesn't know exactly what it is and you don't know exactly what it is, by posting it to the iNaturalist website, other people that are using iNaturalist can help with the identification and discussion about what it might be. And then we get all of that, uh, all of those results through that. So just to show you um, in terms of globally, iNaturalist, it's now, I think it's now up over 70 million observations globally. So a lot of people across the globe are using this app. Um, and you can see in the United States, very, very popular, uh, especially in those areas where people live. Uh, in Texas, same thing. This is as of a couple of days ago. We've passed the 5 million observation mark by over 100,000 observers. Um, and, the, and so that's, let's say that, let's be conservative and say 4 million of those observations may never have happened if it weren't for an app like iNaturalist. So very, very powerful tool for conservation uh, in Texas. The other cool thing that you get when you have an iNaturalist account, you get your own webpage in iNaturalist. So you can view your observations, you can help I other people ID their things. Uh, you can join projects to see what's going on around Texas and elsewhere. Um, and it's just a great, powerful tool. So keep in mind, again, this is very brief, but keep in mind the app on your phone is a data collection tool. The website is where you can really, really learn a lot. And again, uh, a more formal workshop we might be able to offer to you later uh, would go into way more detail on that. There is a second app. The app is known as Seek. It's also by iNaturalist. The nice thing about Seek is it's a free, and again, a free app. You don't have to have um, uh, a, uh, an account. It was designed for kids for younger people. Um, they are, they've kind of gamified it. You can earn badges. You can learn cool facts about things. Uh, it looks like this when you go on there. You can choose a location. You can choose species or just everything. You can look for recent sightings. Then you can take a photo. Um, and basically what happens you, as you point your phone at the thing you're taking a photograph, it's actually going to suggest an ID right there. And then you take a picture and it will then give you more information about that particular plant or animal. So really powerful tools for learning about the natural world. I always tell people if I'd have had this when I was a kid, holy cow, the things I would know now would be amazing. So beyond iNaturalist, we then through iNaturalist and through our work, one of the, we, we sponsor uh, or, or encourage people to participate in, I shouldn't call it sponsor, um, different challenges and, and things out there. Uh, besides the trainings that we do, this is called the Texas City Nature Challenge for, for 2021. Uh, you can see the Balcones area was involved with that. There were 14 different areas involved with this. This is a four-day friendly competition where we invite everybody to get out and document nature over those four days at the end of April and early May. 
And this has become a larger and larger event every year. You can still see though, we've got metropolitan areas and other places we'd like to engage in, in, uh, uh, in this effort as well. So really, really pretty neat uh, event. Another one that's coming up that you might be interested in is the Texas Pollinator BioBlitz. And we take part in that in helping uh, promote this event. This basically is going out from October 1 to 17, taking pictures of the flowers that are out there and the pollinators, both wild and not wild in terms of the flowers, uh, to, to learn more about our pollinators. And we've done this now for a few years, highly successful. You can see some of the results from a couple of years ago uh, when it was non-COVID times down there. We have a couple of other projects that we uh, engage in. The Camera Trap Loan Program, this is where we work with uh, Texas Master Naturalist chapters to loan out uh, game cameras. We give them all the tools, all the training, and they go out and help document what's out there in their area. A lot of that is mammals, but some birds, and, and you can even do reptiles, amphibians, if you set the cameras up the right way. So that's a, another project that uh, the Texas Nature Trackers Program is involved with. And then I mentioned the Loggerhead Shrike Research Project. You can see we color band these birds right here. I'm a federally licensed bird bander. We have volunteers that monitor nests. Um, and here's a couple of little babies, cute little things, aren't they? Um, at, at this uh, round, at the uh, Old Settlers Park in Round Rock. So this again, just kicked off this year. It was supposed to have kicked off last year, but COVID kind of changed that. We have another uh, project that is, was instituted last fall uh, into the winter a grassland sparrow research down here in the Bernie area at Cibolo Preserve, where we're taking a look at these two birds. The bird on the, on the left is a Leconte sparrow, and the bird on the right is a grasshopper sparrow. These are both uh, SGCN, and we have small grasslands in the Bernie area that we're trying to monitor how well do they do over the course of the winter, how, uh, how often do they come back, so we're banding these birds as well. Um, uh, what their populations are, levels are, that kind of thing. So it's again, that we're going into our second season on that. All right. So before we get into what you came here for today, primarily, let's see if there's any questions out there. Um, and uh, Paula, I don't know if you have any that are there and if anybody uh, yep. has any questions. Yes, we do. Um, okay. we have, we, can you hear me okay? I can, I sure can. So we have a question from Mary Jo. She says, I use eBird to track birds and have yep. only put into iNaturalist when I have a photo, which is rare. Right. Do you have data from eBird as well? Uh, she, she add observations of birds such as a loggerhead shrike to iNaturalist, even though she doesn't get a photo? Uh, here's what I would do. Uh, most of the time, in order for the iNaturalist observations to be used, there does have to be some kind of digital record. So it does have to be a photo or a call. Um, iNaturalist now you can record sounds and, and, and longer tracks are pretty vocal, but not always. Um, so I would definitely continue to use eBird because we can get uh, data from eBird on birds. And in fact, because it's so much easier to use because you don't have to have photographs of those birds, um, we, we can mine a lot, of, a lot more data from eBird than from the Birds of Texas project. That said, if you're a photographer and you get bird photographs or recorded sounds, please do upload them to iNaturalist because that data will be used in our uh, ongoing conservation efforts. And I think there are some um, new tools out there too, or some of the apps have been enhanced so that you can actually have them, if you hold your phone up as a bird is singing, it yes. can identify the bird for you. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, oh boy, now you, you're, you got me on the spot here. Um, oh my gosh, what's the name of that app? There are a couple of birding apps that record sound. Um, uh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Why can't I think of it? Oh, Mer uh, Merlin, Merlin, that's it. Merlin is a great app for bird identification songs. Um, so yeah, absolutely. That's the great thing about all this technology now. We're getting so much um, more of it. Um, and and I, I should also clarify, iNaturalist just put the capability of recording so sounds on the iNaturalist app just in the, for the iPhone just in the last few months. Um, for the, uh, uh, the other phone, it's been there for a little while. Uh, but I would absolutely encourage you to download um, uh, the other birding apps that are out there. Audubon has a birding app. Uh, Cornell has a birding app. Um, and... Um, absolutely use all the tools that are available to you 
to help you learn more about what's out there. Okay, great. We've got um, someone also mentioned BirdNet along with Merlin. Oh, okay. Um, there's also one last question here. Um, is sure. there a particular project name for the Loggerhead Shrike Project? The person, Sharla, lives in Round Rock and could. <sighs> Good. So here's the deal. Is Char did you say Sharla? Yes. Is that what I heard. Sharla, I'm just going to talk to you directly. If you are interested in participating in that project moving forward, uh, at the end of this presentation will be my email address. And I would strongly encourage you to write that down or take a screenshot of it and um, email me and we will get you on the list because we are always looking for new volunteers that are interested in the project. And I got to tell you, it's a lot of fun being out there. Uh, chasing these birds around and we've still got work that we're going to do this fall and winter before we get to the next breeding season so uh, please do uh, contact me and we will uh, have a chat and see if you want to get involved perfect all right i'm going to turn it back to you then all right so here we go we're going to jump right into this uh the work that we've been doing uh at our home base here in bernie uh, a few things to think about, regardless of where you are and what you're going to try to do, you need to think about some things before you jump into it. Because I will tell you, um, uh, my wife would like me to retire, but I'm not ready to retire um, because I could literally work in the gardens every day. Every day there's something to do out there. So um, again, when I said earlier in the in, at the beginning where I said that uh, it's not just put it in the ground and walk away from it, there's a lot going on. Uh, that continues to go on as, as your, uh, your habitat areas uh, evolve. So let's think about some of these things. First of all, what do you already have? So if you're gonna, if you wanted, I don't care if it's a, just a little cracker box, little uh, yard like I've got, I've got 0.22 acres. So it's just a standard little yard with a house on it, uh, front yard, backyard. What do you already have? Inventory what, what is there? And that means it's gonna take a little time uh, that's where getting a couple of books on, on uh, native plants uh, is valuable. And I've got a, 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 I'll show you a slide of a bunch of the ones that are around here that you can use. But inventory, observe, document, and then protect those things that are native that you want to, to uh, uh, save. And here's the thing. A lot of times people go in and just rip out everything without doing that. And they may be ripping out very valuable plants. Things like frog fruit and straggler daisy, even though straggler daisy can be a nuisance and I battle it a lot. Um, it, there are times of the year when I let it go because it's maybe may the only flower that's out there for pollinators. Um, and then other times I will chop it back knowing I'm not going to get rid of it. Um, so there's ways to, to th those kinds of things you want to look for. Frog fruit. Um, I don't know if you know what it is, but it's a wonderful little plant that is the host plant for one of our native butterflies and is an incredibly important pollinating plant for many, many uh, butterflies, bees, and other things. So natives, uh, I, I always uh, try it at probably 99% of the time to use natives. And when I say native, I mean native to Texas. Now you can get really strict and say native to your county or your, you know, your immediate area. Um, you can certainly do that. The soils are going to be better adapted for that. Uh, something to keep in mind is that um, when you do go with natives, don't buy natives from more than, you know, I've heard everything from 50 to 200 miles away because their conditions that they grew in are going to be slightly different than where you are. So nearer by for native plants is better. Um, and then also the other advantage of native plants is that the pollinators that are there are adapted to them already. So there are pollinators out there looking for these plants. So you're going to be marrying the two together very, very nicely. Um, select plants that have heads with multiple flowers or flowers and clusters for ease of foraging. So that means sunflowers, members of the sunflower family are really good because they may have anywhere from 10 to 50 to 200 or more flowers on one head. And so a pollinator can visit each one of those small flowers and get a drink, gather some pollen, uh, and save energy if, if, you, if you think about it that way. Um, other kinds of flowers, tubular flowers are, are attractive for bees, beetles, and flies that can walk in. They're great for hummingbirds as well. So the, again, when you're looking at the plants you wanna put in, look at that in terms of the flower shape and structure and the number of flowers, um, consider those things. 
have a mix of flowers with deep flowers and shallow flowers. Some insects have pollinators have short tongues, some have very long tongues. So having a mix of those flowers with short um, individual flowers, tubular flowers or ones with longer ones will just absolutely uh, magnify the diversity of pollinators that can, that can come to your yard. Um, next, select flowers that will provide nectar sources at different seasons. Always have something for pollinators and butterflies. Um, and I've heard different rules about this, but you wanna have at least three or four things in bloom all the way through the season. Uh, and of course, not everything lasts all season. So you wanna be cognizant of that. What's, what are the, some spring bloomers? What are some summer? What are some, what are some fall uh, bloomers? So that you can uh, have something for them at all times of the year. Um, again, you can uh, different size flowers can increase pollinator diversity. Select plants of different heights. So don't have everything just be tall or, or, or short, have them of various heights. Different butterflies might prefer things that are taller or different bees maybe the same way or things that are shorter as well. And generally things in the spring are gonna be shorter than things in the summertime. Uh, also consider, does that plant, is that plant a host for a butterfly? There's a great book that I'm gonna reference in the reference section that actually, for Texas, that actually matches up what the plants are and what the butterfly host plants are. So, uh, you know, we, we know about, most of you will know about milkweed and monarch butterflies, but there's lots of other relationships going on out there. So think about that as well. Uh, so you get dual purpose or dual use out of the plants. And then the other thing I would always encourage you to do is avoid pesticides, uh, chemicals. Uh, there are alternatives that aren't so toxic. And uh, if you start applying pesticides, you're going to uh, the insects and the things you're trying to attract are gonna pay the price for that. So keep that in mind. All right, so where do you go to get plants and seeds? That's, that's one of the questions a lot of people have. Uh, that's a pretty legitimate question. Uh, first of all, research local, uh, local native plant societies or nature centers, Texas Master Naturalists, they have plant sales often in the spring and then again in the fall. Um, so you've got sources locally that you have. You've got a, at least a couple of master uh, naturalist chapters in your area. You've got a native plant society there for sure. Um, and then also any, any retailers that sell native plants. Uh, box stores generally don't sell very many native plants. Um, I'm not saying you can't go look there. The other thing with uh, uh, those big box stores, oftentimes they're using a... a um, uh, not them themselves, but the, the people they're buying their plants from are using neonicotinoids, which are is a, is a uh, pretty toxic chemical that is a systemic plant or a chemical that gets into not only the stems and the leaves to prevent aphids and other things from feeding on them, but it also gets into the nectar and the pollen of the flowers. So if you buy plants that are injected with that, you're essentially killing off the pollinators you're trying to uh, potentially uh, you're trying to attract. So be very cognizant of that. Um, it's very commonplace. Some of the box stores have said they're not selling those plants anymore. I would ask the question um, uh, to find out if they really aren't or if they're just telling you that. Um, so again, uh, native plant rescues. I, you know, I've, I live here in Bernie and I see places that have a, you know, along a street near a highway or wherever that they keep mowing all the native plants. Every time they start to bloom, they mow them down and they're regular mowing. Uh, so I'll go and ask, hey, can I, can I dig up some of these native plants and rescue them? And um, I haven't been turned down yet. That's one way to get a few of those things. Um, you can also collect seeds from native plants along roadsides from friends that are growing them. Collect a few, not all. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind with native seed, whether it's something that you collect from a plant on a, in a roadside ditch or from a friend or you purchase native seed, they must be stratified to germinate. And what that means is all, most all plant seeds have to go through a winter season in order to uh, go through the process to be able to germinate in the spring. So if you buy the seeds in a, in a, that are native and then you just hold them in your house and then it comes spring, you put them out, a lot of them are not gonna germinate. You need to have them in a cold, a lot of times a moist, cold environment um, what I do a lot of times is I'll have sand in a, in a baggie. I'll put the seeds in there, uh, just enough water to wet the sand, throw them in the refrigerator for four to six weeks, pull them out, and then put them in pots and germinate them that way or spread them on the ground. You'll get much better results that way 
Uh, so keep that in mind as well. So those are all things that I think about um, in terms of going into this process. Uh, it seems like a lot, but there's a lot of resources out there um, and uh, you can do a lot with, with a little really. Um, and the other thing is too, you know, if you just want to start to get into it, uh, you don't have to go whole hog like I did. Uh, you can start with just one small bed in your yard or pots even and see how it goes. See what, if you like the idea, see what, what the plants do, how they respond. You can start as small or as large as you want. So keep, in, uh, keep that in mind as we go forward. The other thing I would tell you is learn your native plants. There are lots of really good reference books out there. Familiar side, familiarize yourself with those. Uh, the one that I use all the time is the Wildfires of the Texas Hill Country. That's probably the most direct and, and, and best one for where you live, uh, assuming most of you are in the, in, in the Austin area. Uh, but a new one that's come out is uh, uh, Michael Eason's Wildfires of Texas. Lots more wildfires, but of course it's a state range as is Gaeta's book that's a, kind of a standard out there. There's also other field guides that are more regional, um, but pick up a field guide, actually look at it. Um, these kinds of things will help you in terms of understanding the phenology, when the things flower, um, and then by knowing what your plants are, you know where to, to start. The other thing I would tell you too, is when you're putting in native plants, part of the fun is to actually see what happens as a result of that, um, at least for me being a naturalist and all. So I'm out in my garden a lot of times documenting as you're gonna see what native uh, or what bees and what wasps and butterflies and moths and whatever is coming into my yard as a result of the work that I'm putting into it. So document, okay, keep track of that. Also get yourself a loop, a little, uh, a little uh, 10 power uh, jeweler's loop is fantastic. It will change the way you look at flowers and the world by having that little magnifier to take good close-up looks at the plants and, and, and animals that are out there. It's amazing what you can see with that little loop. Now I have the advantage that when we bought our house three years ago, there was a beat down old nasty greenhouse, which I disassembled and rebuilt entirely uh, using the same old yellowish panels, but it still works. So I've grown a lot of my plants. I've had experience doing this in other places in Minnesota and elsewhere uh, without a greenhouse. But I've uh, almost been a little too successful, but collecting seeds and germinating them, have, making sure they're labeled and growing them up into bigger and bigger pots and then getting them out into the ground. Uh, but this is one thing that you can do if you want to go to that length. Um, again, I, I, I wouldn't have bought a greenhouse if I didn't have one when we got the house, uh, but it sure has come in handy. So I've, gr I've literally grown thousands of plants, not all of them have survived but I've got thousands of plants that um, I've been able to germinate and uh, grow in the yard in, in the past three years, just with that tiny little simple uh, to use greenhouse. So we purchased this house three years ago. This is what it looked like when we purchased it. Um, if you start looking around the, the yard, the front yard here, the backyard here, you're gonna start to see a lot of non-native plants. There's irises here. There's another plant right here. There's one here, an olive tree. There's a magnolia, non-native magnolia. There's a lyrope over here. I'm probably not even saying it right. Uh, the, the yard was full of pecan trees. And oh, by the way, um, I love my pecan trees until they produce lots of pecans because the squirrels come in. I spend a lot of time digging up baby pecan trees. In the backyard, we had these palms and ferns and various things like that. We had uh, uh, all of this non-native to our area. Um, so we had our grass was St. Augustine grass, which everybody loves to grow because it grows well in the shade, uh, but it's uh, non-native. We had non-native shrubs and trees, including Nandina, olive, boxwood, magnolia, ligustrum, ugh, ligustrum, uh, as well as sago and other palms. We had non-native irises, purple heart, lyrope, vinca, Asiatic dayflower, and garlic. I'll tell you right now, getting rid of Asiatic dayflower is an impossibility, but at least it puts on a pretty flower. Uh, so I can live with it temporarily anyway. Um, and garlic's hard to get rid of as well. Um, but that's what we have. And it did look really pretty when we looked at it to buy it. I mean, I have to say it really did um, uh, because it was nice and green, right? Um, a very lush green backyard. And a lot of people would say, this is awesome. Well, we had a slightly different vision of what we wanted for this small yard in Bernie, Texas. 
So this is the front yard in the spring. This is what it looked like before it began. We did have a couple of plants. We did have a couple of uh, so talls here and here. And we had a couple up here against the house. Um, we did take those so talls, Texas so talls that are native to this part of the country. And we moved them out in the front because what we were after was to have some kind of barrier because uh, as you all know, there are a lot of deer around here, both uh, axis deer in our case and white-tailed deer. And we had to figure out if we're gonna put in native plants, they like native plants, what are we gonna do to kind of protect them? So we started uh, by moving a couple of these plants that were up against here, and then we got rid of all the other stuff, okay? We literally dug it out. We actually put it in boxes and gave it away on the street corner and people wanted them. Uh, maybe that's not the right thing to do, but the Nandinas and a few other things we just cut down and threw away, recycled, if you will. This is what the yard looked like in the second July after we bought the house. We did put up a picket fence. We did that because our yard is so small. Um, we have deer walking up and down the street all the time. Not one time have they gone into the yard. Now, obviously, white-tailed deer can easily jump this picket fence, but my argument is the yard is so small, I don't think the deer want to go in there because it's such a confined space. Um, so we've never had a deer in our yard since we put up the picket fence. We, the plants that we plant outside the picket fence along these, rock, these rocks are all plants that the deer tend to not eat. We haven't had any problems with that. Um, and uh, now I should tell you, this is a pretty wild looking yard here from two years ago. It looks very different this year. One of the things you're gonna find out when you're using native plants, especially annuals, annuals burst out of the ground when you put them in the ground, like they have here, the, the annual sunflowers and cowpen daisies all through here. This year, we don't have as many of either one of them. So what happened is, I think, we raised up all of these, these annuals, lots and lots of seeds. The goldfinches, both American and, and, and lesser goldfinches came in and ate all the seeds. So we had a lot fewer of them on the ground. Um, to, and so uh, we'll have to probably supplement with cowpen daisy seeds next year. So uh, it does vary year to year. So this year it looked like, or two, a year ago, it looked like this looks a little different uh, this year. Now, just to give you a, a, a front door view out to the street, we are fortunate we have Cibolo Creek across the street. So there's no houses here. And it, obviously Cibolo Creek being a, a little uh, riparian area, attracts a lot of wildlife, especially birds. Uh, and of course, it attracts all the deer as well. So this is before restoration began. Again, just a lawn, a few non-native plants. This is what it looked like uh, in July uh, of last year. Um, we had taken this entire section of the yard and, and, and uh, transposed it to native plant garden, our wildlife habitat. And then we started carving out parts of the yard for additional native plants. Now, the trick with this is you'll see all of this is in the shade. And not every plant, native plant likes to grow in the shade. In fact, a lot of them don't. So it's an experiment for us. We've been, uh, we get some afternoon sun here. We get almost no afternoon sun here. So we're, we've got some things that we're starting to look at. Does it grow well in the shade or does it not grow well in the shade? Uh, but I experiment too. I've got some things growing here in shady areas like uh, um, um, Blackfoot daisy, which is a, a caliche, rocky soil growing thing out in the hot sun. It does amazingly well in these shaded areas. I should also tell you one other thing, because we live above a creek, our soil, and I, and I apologize for this ahead of time, our soil is rich and deep and sandy. Um, so we don't have rocks unless somebody hauled the rocks into our soil. It gets to be a clay base about, uh, about 18 inches down below the ground and uh, turns to a lot of clay. But, uh, but in here, it's easy digging for us. We have left a little bit of yard. Eventually this all convert to something else, but uh, we, have, we have a dog. So we want to give our puppy a, a place to run and, and, uh, and explore. And, and she has adapted to all of these flowers, exploring all those as well. So, uh, but that's a, it's a process. Like I say, it goes, um, uh, differs year to year. So just to kind of isolate different parts of the yard, this is that front part of the yard we converted completely to wildflowers. This is what it looks like in the springtime. That's the other thing. Think about seasonal. Things are going to change. All of these things that you're seeing blooming right here, none of them are blooming now. A whole different thing, uh, group of plants are blooming. But you can see a lot of them are shorter. 
by the time the summer comes and, and is done, everything that's growing out there, a lot of them will be higher than this fence. Um, we did try to plant some that are shorter along the sidewalk. There's, and again, knowing how the plant responds, how it grows will be very, very important. Um, but lots and lots of diversity here, lots of different colors, different flower shapes, different heights. We also mixed in native grasses. Uh, the native grasses give some structure, plus native grasses are host plants for um, nymph butterflies and also uh, skipper butterflies. So we wanted to have some of that. Provi it also provides extra structure for other plants to lean against. So we've got little blue stem and, and Indian grass and side oats grama um, and uh, can uh, Canada and Virginia wild rye are our primary ones that we have. Um, so that is what it looks like in the spring. This is of this spring. Okay, um, going back to this area again, this is the second year. Here's the third year. And you can see this is ranked, man. A lot of people look at this and go, you've got nothing but a weed bed. Okay, I happen to live in a neighborhood that's on a dead end street across from a creek. There are three other houses, four other houses on our street. And we do not live by the rules of any neighborhood association. Uh, those are battles you'll have to fight. Um, and it may limit what you can do. So you don't have to get this crazy and wild and rank. Um, but I'll tell you what, the bees and the butterflies and the birds all love this. It's just a small sliver of wild and the birds and all of those critters actually respond to that really, really nicely. So uh, again, we actually have a path, believe it or not, there's a little rocky, a rock path. We had extra flagstones that were laying around the yard. We created a path so we could get through this. Sometimes you can and sometimes you can't so much. So, but again, lots and lots of diversity, different things blooming at different times, all very, very important. So this whole thing has been dedicated to native plants. We also then, we had this little area against the house just to show you there's the path right there. We also put these in here. We actually put up a trellis for some native vines, Alamo vine and passion vine. Um, uh, so that they could grow up there and they produce a lot of flowers for the pollinators as well. Here's this side of the yard over here. So we've already talked about this side over here. Here's where we um, uh, carved out pieces all the way around. That meant getting rid of a lot of plants in here and putting in natives. We'll show you that here in a moment. But you can see we kind of carved out an area here and put in beautyberry and some native wildflowers here, put in a red bud down here. Um, and some other, there's some uh, uh, creek plums in here. Uh, and we've added just a lot, another red bud over here. So it just kind of wraps around. And again, it provides a little bit of habitat. We put in a native grass that grows in the shade right here. It tends to grow really well. So we're actually having to control that a little bit and that's okay. But again, it gives it structure, it covers the ground. One of the things you'll notice is that there's bare ground here. Uh, we actually like to have some bare ground in the gardens, and that is because a lot of our native bees and wasps, and, and, and don't think red wasp here, but our native bees and wasps nest underground, so they'll nest under leaf litter, they'll nest in bare ground, uh, we want, and tunnel down under there, so we want to leave some bare ground to in, encourage them to nest uh, in our yard, and we, I've actually this year for the first time witnessed different species of springtime bees going into uh, nest holes. Uh, underground. So that's pretty cool. We had our first bumblebee this spring. They didn't stay in the yard, but uh, this summer I've actually built some bumblebee houses um, and uh, we're going to deploy those uh, this winter and into spring and see if any bumblebees will be attracted to that or any other bees of any, any kind. Um, again, here's another patch of that, uh, what it looked like when we started carving it out. And here it is again from a different angle. So again, you can see that it's grown up uh, quite a bit over the course of the two years of our work. And then we have this area in the front of the house on the other side of the, the sidewalk. We've built this up quite a bit. And you can see we continue to add things. We've added a combination of wildflowers and native plants, or woody plants, I should say. And again, trying to diversify what we have in different flowering times and that kind of thing is real important. On the outside of the picket fence, this is the spring. This was what looked like this spring. Uh, with the uh, uh, pink evening primroses. By the way, this stuff spreads like wildfire, so keep that in mind. We originally put it, rescued a few plants and put them right here. They're now inside the other garden, so they're, they're going all over the place. So I've got lots of plants to move here, there, and everywhere. Um, but you can see a lot of growth covers up some of the fence over time. We're okay with that. Um, and um, uh, again, plants out here, lantana, native lantana, damianita, 
uh, mealy blue sage, the uh, pink evening primrose, and a few other things that the, that the um, uh, deer don't bother at all. So be selective if you've got to deal with deer issues. So now let's move to the backyard. So here's what the backyard looked like before restoration. These are old pictures from the Board of Realtors. Um, so that's why they're a little bit fuzzy when you blow them up this big. Uh, but here it is. This is uh, looking out from the house. Here's the back door right here where the picture is taken from. You can see that there's uh, just bare ground here. There's really no, no plant. This is after I removed everything. So it's pretty barren after you have this. And a lot of people would have thought I was crazy doing that. By the way, back here is a big old oak tree on the neighbor's property. Um, and it has a, a Boston ivy plant that goes down and all of this back here is Boston Ivy. And let me tell you, it's really hard to pull out. Um, the winter storm killed the entire plant on the above ground part. Uh, it's now starting to come back and we've actually erected a privacy fence along here uh, and it tends to wanna to grow through that. So we still have to control that and probably always will. But one of the things we wanted to do is if you look at this backyard, we've got these great big oak trees in the neighbor yard. Um, but we have no, just a sterile ground layer. This is a biological desert, basically. Um, we had no shrub layer. There's nothing really here. Um, there's no understory, so there's no smaller trees to provide habitat. And when we're thinking about that, we're thinking about birds. And, and birds use different parts of the layers of a forest. We wanted to create that in the backyard. And so what we started doing is putting, creating that habitat. We put in some native grasses. We put in some wildflowers back here, some low growing shrubs back in here, and then filled this whole area up against the, the uh, fence with other native shrubs back in here. Again, not taking the whole yard, but a lot of diversity. The other thing that we do is we make sure we have at least two of each species, because if you only have one and it flowers, well, we don't want self-pollination. They don't want self-pollination. So having two provides a little more diversity. I will say with some of the native shrubs, you have no idea if it's male or female, if it's one of those plants where the males are on one flower or one plant and the females are on another flower or plant. So you gotta keep that in mind as well. So, so kind of hedge. We're creating an understory layer, things like Mexican plum. And um, over here, we've got some Eve's necklace, some smaller trees that are kind of gonna fill in that gap that be, exists between the ground and the canopy of the um, uh, of our pecan trees and those oaks in the backyard on the other side of the fence back there. So that's, and this is a work in progress. This is gonna take time uh, to do this, but we've already seen good growth from all of these trees and shrubs. And we continue, I expect to continue that uh, as we go forward. I wanted to share with you a few of the shrubs that we actually, and small trees that we did put in. Uh, you all are familiar with most of these. Agarita, a lot of people would go, why would you put agarita in there? because um, agarita can be weedy. A lot of times the reason we have so much agarita in the hill country is because it's one thing the deer don't eat. So it's one of the leftovers. We put a couple of agaritas in and its cover, its, its cousin Barberry, because in the spring, it is one of the most valuable pollinator plants out there. When nothing else is blooming and agarita blooms, it attracts every pollinator known to to, uh, to exist out there at that time of the year. Plus it produces those wonderful red berries that wildlife will eat as well. So it's a good habitat tree. Now we may come to regret it, I don't know, but we can monitor it because we've only got two plants. So something to keep in mind. Uh, there's always a saw. Remember that, <laughs> you've always got a saw. You can, you can cut things out if you have to. Another sh uh, shrub that we put in that's native is uh, known as wafer ash. Nice thing about wafer ash is it grows into a small tree or a shrub. It's a host plant of this butterfly right here called the giant swallowtail and also a two-tailed swallowtail. This is what their caterpillar looks like. Looks like bird droppings. Uh, so we've put three of those in there uh, in the backyard to, to, to create another plant, another layer, um, and they can communicate with each other. We did put in a Texas persimmon. We, may, we are going to have to put in a second one at some point. We're going to see if it even grows in this really rich soil. Uh, but again, in the spring, really important pollinator plant. Very tiny flowers. Males and female flowers are on different plants. Uh, but all the butterflies, I even have a picture of a monarch butterfly nectaring on this tiny little thing in the spring. Uh, but a lot of butterflies use the flowers. They produce these wonderful edible fruits in the, in the, in the spring and summer. Uh, at least I like them. 
Uh, now I'm probably going to be a, if once if it ever gets big enough to flower and attract fruit, it's also going to attract raccoons. So I got to keep that in mind as well. But again, very very valuable plant. A lot of people don't think of it again because it's something the deer generally don't eat. We put in a couple of Texas red buds. Beautiful pink flowers. A lot of you know about this. It's a beautiful landscape plant. Make sure around here you get the Texana. Has the thicker leaves than the eastern red bud. The eastern red bud won't survive around here. It's too hot. Uh, it is a host plant for this little butterfly known as the Henry's elephant. So again, wonderful little plant. A lot of people use that one. And then there's Mexican buckeye that also has pink flowers in the springtime. It's a small shrub to a small tree. Compound leaves. It also is a host plant for the Henry's elephant. So I'm hoping someday maybe we'll get lucky enough to see a Henry's elephant. We put in a couple of native uh, plums. Uh, Creek plum tends to grow in small thickets like this. So that's one we'll have to keep an eye on. But in the springtime, huge number of pollinators visit those flowers when they're blooming. Uh, and it is a small tree. It's uh, generally only about 12 feet tall. Um, as I mentioned, a good pollinator. And then we put in Mexican plum, two of those. Uh, these are gonna be more of an understory tree uh, and the reason I put those in is that, uh, I'm gonna show it to you here in a moment. This is from, these are the images on one two hour period this spring after the big storm, the big snowstorm. These are all images of insects that were, that were nectaring on the flowers of, of one Mexican plum at Cibolo Nature Center here in Bernie. Um, everything uses this. Now the flowers don't last very long, um, but I'm telling you, in the springtime, you can see how valuable it is to everyone that's out there looking for a nectar source. All right, so uh, in the backyard, after we ripped out the vinca and everything else here, this is what it looks like now. We put in a lot of native plants, some that prefer shade, put in a couple of shrubs. We had this, this whole water feature was there. We resurrected that, and fixed it up. Um, now here, the reason I put this picture in is because you see all those cedar wax wings. Cedar wax wings eat fruit, okay? Um, they poop the fruit. And um, those seeds, after they pass through the bird, germinate really well. And unfortunately in Bernie, Texas and elsewhere, they eat a lot of seed fruits that are non-native. And as a result of that, I'm pulling non-native seedlings out of the gardens all the time. So keep in mind, water is a great way to attract wildlife, but keep in mind there are costs to that. Anyway, so that's what it looks like. We put up a, a, a little trellis here for a clematis that we have, a native clematis um, and snapdragon vine. But we've got a variety of things in here. So again, some shrubs that love the shade, um, a variety of colors, a variety of blooming times so that we can um, uh, keep that green and, and going well. Here's this little bed that had these, this thing in here, uh, this palm. This is what it looks like today. Um, we added this little water feature here, just a, a calm water feature. Here's the, here's the, this is the second year, this is the third year, I got these out of order. Second year right here, third year, you can see things have grown up, done really well. Um, and then back here, I wanted to show you this. So when we bought the house, it had this little ring of rocks around this pecan tree and it had this little ring of rocks here with some kind of non-native yucca. We converted those to this. What I did is I found some frostweed, which is of vital importance to migrating monarchs in the fall. We put a few around here. They get rid this year with all the rainfall. I've got some that are almost 10 feet tall. Uh, they're going to have white flowers on them. They're just now starting to bloom. Uh, but we ringed this here to create some habitat uh, for, I mean, lizards use this area, butterflies use the area, birds use the area. And then the other thing that we did where that uh, yucca was, we actually dug this out. And again, we have good soil, so it's easy to do. We dug this out about a foot deep. I put an old, um, or just a liner, one of those tarps on the ground because I wanted to get some plants that actually need more water um, because I don't have a wetland here in the yard, obviously. But I wanted cardinal flower, which is what this tall, these tall red flowers are here. This is a primrose right here. We've got a few other things sneaking in here. But we filled it back in with soil and then we planted plants that um, require more water. They need to have their roots moist. And so we watered it. And every once in a while, we add a little bit of water. It keeps the soil wet. These plants have responded incredibly well. We tried growing cardinal flower, um, Lobelia cardinalis, outside of this kind of structure, and they couldn't survive. 
It's just, you couldn't keep it wet enough. This keeps it wet. And the hummingbirds are just loving these cardinal flowers. They're in bloom. This was taken about three days ago. Um, and they are some of them about four and a half, five feet tall. So anyway, so that's where we took some extra little areas. We did put in a water feature. All of these are rocks that were laying around the yard. Um, and we've, I've rebuilt this water feature three or four times trying to get the right thing going. But we, what we did is create a little pool here. Every day um, we have robins and chickadees and goldfinches and everybody else coming in here and taking a bath, getting a drink of water. Now I've got to fill in over here, this angle, you can see the tube right here. What we did was sink a plastic tub in the ground here and then added rocks to build it up. We did another plastic tub here and added water that comes off through here as well. Uh, so the, the sound creates a lot of attention from the birds. And of course, the birds, you, you love it for bathing and for drinking. And then we found little odd corners around the house and we planted those into native plants. So we've tried to use every, every little square inch we could while also keeping in mind we have a dog that we wanted to take care of. One of the things that's kind of a, an odd thing that we did, we had this um, um, uh, magnolia tree that we didn't want, so we cut it off. After it, all the brant leaves fell off, it, it turned into a great bird feeding tree. So we have it propped up with some rebar right here. It's now rotting away ever so slowly. The squirrels do get on it once in a while, but look at all the perch sites for the birds. So if you're gonna feed birds, that's a thing to keep in mind. Where can the birds land? Where can they get to safety very quickly? What we've done is we had a hackberry tree come up right here. It's now taller than this. We're gonna use that hackberry tree as, a, as the uh, transition it to the feeding tree once this tree rots away a little bit further. We did create a brush pile the first year. We've now put it, uh, taken that out. Uh, we found that it attracted a couple of rats. It was great for winter birds to hide in, uh, but also the house sparrows that are around like to use it. So we decided to take that out. If I had a bigger property, I would, I would have a brush pile for sure. So here's what we've got. I'm not gonna read all this. These are all the native woodland, woody plants that we've put in. Um, these are native vines that we've put in, a lot, of, a lot of diversity. Again, one of the things I always tell people, diversity gets, begets diversity. If you have more diverse plants, you have more diverse animals, okay? And uh, I see somebody wanting to take a picture of that, so I'll let you do that. All right, you got your picture, Beth? Okay, very good. And then we, uh, in terms of forbs, we've got things like six species of milkweed, different penstemons, different species of buttercup, uh, legumes, euphorbia, primroses, verbenas, a mint family, um, at least 45 species of composites have been put into the yard. Um, we have all of these native grasses. Again, diversity beginning diversity. It's really what we're after here. Uh, here's some examples of what we've been growing. Uh, you can also see with some of the pictures, you can see some of the native bees that have visited. Before we put any of this in, there were no native bees. There were no butterflies. It was a biological desert. A, a butterfly might drift by, but they certainly never stopped. Um, so these are all examples of native plants supporting native bees. Here's some more, um, again, diversity, different times of the year blooming. Uh, we even had somebody give us some uh, lace, uh, lace cactus that we put in that was successful out in front of the picket fence. But again, you can kind of see that diversity that we've got across the, the scale. We've seen now more than 50 species of butterflies. Um, there's a hummingbird right outside my window right now looking at me um, that have visited our yard. Um, and a few are now starting to lay eggs as I'm gonna show you in a moment. Uh, over 80 species of insects. And when I say insects, I'm talking butterflies, moths, bees, wasps, flies, those kinds of things that are visiting the flowers. Um, these are all examples of putting in plants that were host plants for different butterflies, and now they're using us. So we've got the Gulf fritillary here because we have passion vine. We've got the queen, and here's its caterpillar. First one I found in the yard last night, believe it or not, uh, was feeding on our Texas milkweed. Uh, we haven't had a monarch yet, but we've got now had a, a, a queen. We're thrilled with that. Our little tiny wafer ashes that are no more than three feet tall right now are hosting two giant swallowtail caterpillars. And then this summer, because of um, this little butterfly called the bordered patch, beautiful little butterfly, they lay gobs of eggs and gobs of caterpillars. They have devastated uh, our cow pen daisies. They've raised three generations now 
Uh, so our cow pen daisy patch doesn't look very good this year because these things just eat them out of house, out, eat it out of house and home. The plants come back, but it takes a while. So anyway, this is an example of results. Here's what we wanted. We wanted to see all life stages of these butterflies, and now we're getting them. Now, some of you are going to go, oh my gosh, wasps, why would you have pictures of wasps? In one three-day period, I documented eight species of new wasps in our yard, all feeding on this plant. If we were in person, I would ask you what this plant is. It is known as snow on the mountain. It is a native plant. It grows in waste areas a lot of the time, roadside ditches. It is this time of the year, one of the most important pollinator plants when it's hot and dry, uh, because almost nothing else is blooming in any quantity. We have documented so many different species of butterflies using this to nectar. Uh, bees that are out there, all three of these little tiny bees are feeding on there. And the reason this is so popular, if you look at the flowers close up, you can see these little discs, these little greenish discs. They're full of nectar. So all of these things, these bees all kill prey and bury them to feed their egg, their, their, their offspring. But they all nectar on flowers, even the big old red wasp here nectars on flowers and this particular flower attracts a ton of different things. Um, so I recommend this plant in small numbers. The nice thing about it, it's an annual. It's if you got too many of them, pull them, pull some, pull some, control it. So I have one designated area for my snow on the mountains and the response by the, by the wildlife is fantastic. Now here's the other thing. The other day I was watching, I'd just taken pictures of all of these wasps out here. And I'm standing in my window watching the garden, and all of a sudden there's a there's three or four summer tanagers in the garden. They're eating the bees and the wasps. They're actually wasp feeders. So look at this. I went from having the flowers, the critters that eat the nectar of the flowers, to now the things that eat the things that are eating the nectar and the flowers. So I'm increasing my trophic levels of, of, of uh, diversity in my yard. I feel a little bad for the bees and wasps, but at the same time, it's pretty cool to watch that evolution. And just speaking of birds, we've had over 70 species of birds uh, documented that have come through the yard. We've got a couple of nest boxes for chickadees and titmice and, and uh, wrens. In the wintertime, we get a, a, a quite a variety of, of, of sparrows that come through, vireos that nest near either in the yard or across the creek, but visit the yard in the water. Every one of these birds, the Phoebe, the, the Great Crested Flycatcher, even the Canada Warbler, they will come to water. If you're gonna to try to attract birds, water, 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 water is the best way to do it, honestly. So what's next? We wanna to continue to weed out remnants of non-native grasses and other plants, continue to add species from the greenhouse and through uh, limited purchases now. I have a favorite place to go buy native plants. And oh my gosh, it's really hard now because I almost have no room to put anything. So it's depressing <laughs> in that regard. Um, move things around. I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to digging something up and putting it in a better place if it's not growing well or if it's being crowded out by something else. I document everything in my yard with iNaturalist. I set up my own yard iNaturalist project. I'll show you the results of that here momentarily. Uh, and then we're just going to slowly kind of incrementally expand the garden space as possible. And then I sit back and enjoy and I do a ton of photography in the yard. Keep in mind, if you're going to do this, even on a smaller scale, if you do it and then you never go outside and actually revel in what's out there, then what's the point, right? Um, so make sure you get out there and actually enjoy it, document what's going on, and let's learn about it uh, and share that information. All right, here's another stopping point for questions. I know we're at 1014. I don't have a whole lot left to do. I do wanna go through some native plants. So um, it looks like there must be a lot of questions. Um, how do you wanna approach this, Paula? Well, I'm gonna just um, go through these relatively quickly because okay. there, there's a theme here. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, <laughs> Mary Jo wants to know, can you transplant Argarita? Um, I've never tried to transplant our uh, agarita. The, 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 uh, they have pretty good root systems and, and finding small, little, small enough agaritas to transplant. Um, I've never seen any baby agaritas growing out in nature. I've only seen the big ones. Um, probably your best bet would be to get to a native plant nursery and see if they sell those. Um, but, you know, give it a try. Here's the thing. 
I have transplanted some woody plants and I didn't think I got enough root. And basically what I would do is I'd get it home, I'd put it in a bucket of water for a couple of days, and I would get it in the ground, I would water it really well, and then I'd just keep an eye on it. And a lot of, sometimes all of the leaves die off, but then all of a sudden you see regrowth. So any native woody plant I put in the yard, none of them have died yet, knock on wood. None of them have died yet, and including some transplants with very limited root structure. So it can be done. Agarita, I don't have experience with directly. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, for stratification, this is from Ann. For stratification, mm -hmm. do you put the seeds in the refrigerator or the freezer? Fr refrigerator. You don't want to freeze them necessarily. You probably could, but down here, the ground doesn't freeze. So I wouldn't do that. That's why a refrigerator would be the, the optional. And what I usually do is I put them in the, um, down at the bottom where they have those little cooler you know, those little trays for vegetables and stuff. I put them down there for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, and then the other thing to do with that, after about four to five weeks, start watching the, 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 the uh, sand, make sure the seeds don't start germinating in there uh, prematurely, because sometimes that'll happen. Okay, great. Um, and then a couple of folks uh, pointed out some of the native plant sales that are coming up. Okay, uh, good. There's one coming up in Georgetown on the September 25th. Um, and then, of course, the uh, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center is going to have their sale coming up, too. Oh, so my gosh, I forgot. You guys are right next door to that place. Man, yeah, so that's good. lucky. So okay. uh, Mary Jo had another question. How do you keep the birds from hitting the windows? So that's a great question because we had that problem. Um, um, so what we ended up doing was taking a piece of lath. Um, you know, you can buy like three foot pieces of lath. And then uh, my wife came up with the idea of buying that, um, that ribbon you can buy for like wrapping gifts and parties and stuff like that, you know, that's curly. And um, she actually taped, uh, wrap, loops those around the lath and lets it hang down. And then we tack that above the window. So when the wind blows, that, 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 that uh, ribbon is going back and forth like this. It doesn't really obstruct our view. Um, some people might think it looks weird. But when it's moving, it keeps the birds. And we've been, since we put that up, when we put that up, and it's usually in the wintertime, um, we've had almost no bird strikes uh, using that methodology. So uh, it's fairly inexpensive and it seems to work for us anyway. Oh, good. Uh, and Mark asked the question You use the term composites. What is a composite? Very good. Composite is a sunflower. It's a member of the sunflower family. So, it, you know, it's the annual sunflower. It's um, there's, there's gazillions of them. I have an entire book just on the sunflower family, but it is the sunflower family. OK, uh, a couple of other questions specifically about some plants. What do you think about Esperanza and amaranth? Amar well, so amaranth doesn't really, I mean, the amaranths that are wild and native don't really have, uh, I haven't used that. I probably wouldn't use that. I don't know how much value that one has uh, for what my purposes are. In terms of Esperanza, I did put in a couple of those. They, um, they flowered and I saw, I've seen um, Esperanza attract a lot of butterflies in other settings. So I certainly... It's more native, I think, more to the south and west, but um, certainly it's, it's native to the state of Texas and uh, it does have some wildlife value. So I've seen bumblebees, wasps, and butterflies use that, uh, use those flowers. So yeah, there you go. Okay, one last question here. Um, the grass in your front yard, when you showed that picture, you mentioned your dog. Are you thinking of replacing the grass or are you just gonna leave it? Well, I, what I'd like to do is actually try to put in, um, uh, and I know it's, it's a sun-loving plant, but I would like to really put in, uh, a, um, oh, what am I trying to think of? What's the native grass? Uh, now my brain's going to, my brain's going to misfire, uh, but there's a, uh, there's a native, uh, what is it? You're thinking buffalo grass? Buffalo grass. And, and I know buffalo grass grows best in the sun, but I think that we have enough dappled shade because of the structure of our, our, our um, pecan trees that we might be successful. So I'll probably experiment with that this next spring and see if I can get it to sustain itself. Uh, otherwise we may just have to, you know, have a little bit of St. Augustine. We don't water it. We don't take care of it at all. Um, so if it dies, then we'll replace it with something else. So I'm still experimenting with natives, shorter native grasses to see what I can come up with. 
Well, well, I must admit there are probably several people on the call who are very jealous of the fact that you have dirt. I know. That's why I feel a little guilty. I got to give that disclaimer because because <laughs> uh, I and I grew up in Iowa, so I never I, the only rocks I ever saw in Iowa were on gravel roads. So trust me, <laughs> <laughs> I feel pretty darn lucky. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't have to use a jackhammer to get into the ground. Oh, okay. Well, I just, just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. I'm going to hand it back over to you then. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Very good. Well, let's keep going here. So I want to, I do want to go through some native plants that uh, do attract and we'll do this fairly quickly since we're running a little short on time. Uh, but the milkweeds, there are lots of different milkweeds. And of course you all know that they attract monarch butterflies. They also attract queens. So in the summertime, it's very rare to see a monarch butterfly in our area, although this year has been an exception. Um, I've seen more monarchs this summer than I've seen in all the years I've lived here in Texas in June, July, and August. I don't know why that is. Uh, other people have, have said the same thing. Uh, but there are lots of different species. The Texas milkweed right here is an endemic, which means it only grows in Texas. It also grows in the shade. It's a shade-loving plant. In fact, the one that I had, one of them ones that I have in the front yard uh, is the one that uh, the, uh, the picture I had of the queen caterpillar, it's eating it right now. Um, the most common one we have in our area is um, antelope horns up here. I if I can get rid of that. Oh, hang on, let me go back. I'm trying to get rid of this silly thing, but hopefully that's not the way. Um, but antelope horns is the most common one. It grows in the roadside ditches everywhere. A really close relative is the green milkweed. It has wider leaves, needs a little bit wet, wetter soil typically. Um, but it is more common east of us, uh, but there are places around here where you can find it. Uh, and then Zizotes grows throughout the state in most parts of the state. It's not as an attractive a plant as these other three, so keep that in mind. In your area, two that you might consider would be butterfly weed, and this is not tropical milkweed, by the way. Tropical milkweed grows four to five feet tall, has yellow and orange flowers, Butterfly and, and milky white milky sap. Uh, butterfly weed has clear sap and it has bright orange flowers and only grows to a couple feet tall. Uh, but it grows in tall grass prairie areas. You can find it, but don't confuse that with um, tropical milkweed. Tropical milkweed, there's lots of debate about whether we should be planting it at all. It's not native to the state of Texas. Unfortunately, it grows really well in the state of Texas, um, but it also focuses and concentrates uh, potential diseases on monarch caterpillars, which then results in weak and uh, um, uh, unable to survive very long uh, adult uh, caterpillars. That's a whole discussion by itself. And then it also in certain places along wetland areas, you will find swamp milkweed. This grows five or six feet tall, beautiful flowers, butterflies, everything loves these things. This grows along river areas. We've got some, I found a, a colony up in along the Guadalupe River up towards Kerrville. And you'll find in the tall grass prairie as you, region of the state, as you go farther north, you'll find more and more of this growing. Beautiful, beautiful wildflower. It's one of those, if I can get it to grow, I'm going to put it in that little wet area with my cardinal flower and see if I can get it to survive, if I can germinate some seeds. Uh, one that if I had to choose, people often ask, well, if you had to choose, what, what, what the one plant would you put in? It would be mealy blue sage. It would absolutely be mealy blue sage. The reason for that is the deer don't eat it. Secondly, it blooms uh, over and over. It starts in the spring and blooms all the way into the fall. So it blooms several different times. It spreads. It does spread some, um, but you can control that. You can move it around a little bit fairly easily. It, it, it's a hardy plant. It's a perennial. Um, that is a great plant for butterflies, bees, and everything else. Its cousin farther to the north is the giant blue sage. It grows in the tall grass regions of the, of the country. Uh, so it may not, I, I, I don't have that one here, but I, I put it in here because it does grow a little bit farther to the north and east. Um, cone flowers. Now the purple cone flower is actually not a very common plant in Texas but a very much a favorite one of people to grow in their gardens and certainly attracts a lot of attention. Our native one that's in our area is pale purple coneflower, Echinacea angustifolia. So if you're out there looking for it, look for angustifolia. It's a taller plant, paler ray flowers. By the way, this is a composite. 
Composites have disc flowers up here and ray flowers. That's what these are hanging down here. So this one plant right here may have as many as 150 flowers on it, just so you know. Um, but the, either one of those are wonderful for attracting butterflies and bees. Another plant that grows very commonly in the hill country and grows in rocky areas um, is prairie verbena. Uh, it attracts lots and lots of activity, uh, all kinds of butterflies nectar on it, bees nectar on it. It has the flower itself has a small tube, so it does certain things don't use it because they can't get to the bottom where the nectar is. And then another annual, an annual, that's a perennial. An annual, by the way, is basket flower. It grows fairly tall. Big butterflies especially love it. Uh, it's one of those plants that once you get it, when it drops seeds in the fall, you're going to have it every year. Um, and so you want to manipulate that in terms of how much do you want to have, but it's really a gorgeous plant. Then there's different kinds of foxgloves or penstemons. These are three. Gulf Coast, you saw in one of my flowers, somebody gave me some of those one spring. Uh, it grows along the Gulf Coast, but it grows really well here. It attracts a lot of bee activity. Uh, and so I've actually got some in my yard, again, native to Texas, but not necessarily native to Bernie, Texas. So keep that in mind. So I'm not a complete purist here. But then other foxgloves, these are especially, if you notice the design of the flowers, large insects like bees can land on the platform here and then crawl in to get the nectar and then pollinate the flowers. Scarlet penstemon is a beautiful hill country native plant. So that's one to watch for at a plant sale or otherwise. Cobea grows fairly well. And oh, by the way, if you have a small greenhouse or just want to try these in pots, the seed, th these are super easy to germinate. I got more seeds of Gulf Coast or seedlings of Gulf Coast penstemon than I can possibly uh, uh, have in my yard. So, um, geez, if you're ever in Bernie, Texas, look me up. I'll hook you up with some Gulf Coast penstemon. Um, anyway, uh, another plant that grows wild that I'm not sure I'd recommend for a garden although I did put a couple in this year, one survived, these are perennials, is Texas thistle. Not, not those big old thistle plants you see growing everywhere in the weed ditches and stuff. This is a native thistle and it attracts all kinds of pollinators. Okay, butterflies, bees, you name it. Um, but again, with the caveat that you're gonna wanna manage it a little bit and not get the wrong species of thistle. Then we have red flowers that are obviously great for hummingbirds and also butterflies known as sulfurs. Uh, cedar sage grows in the springtime. I've got some around a pecan tree, not under a cedar tree at all. Their leaves are more round, generally rounded, whereas those of tropical sage are more pointed or arrow shaped, if you will. Uh, this one blooms on and off throughout the entire spring, summer and fall. And the hummingbirds love it and it can get quite tall. It spreads nicely. So I've got it in various, every garden I have has some tropical sage and I like it that way. Uh, easy to grow from seed, by the way. And then other red flowers, Turk's cap is a small shrub that a lot of you may be familiar with. Great for uh, sulfur butterflies and hummingbirds. The cardinal flower, look at how beautiful those flowers are. Again, hummingbird favorite. And then standing cypress is a biennial. This, uh, by the way, cardinal flower is a perennial. Standing cypress is a biennial, so if you start from scratch, you're going to have no flowers the first year, uh, the second year you will, the third year you may not, so you've got to stagger those if you want to have them every year. And then you're familiar with black-eyed Susan or brown-eyed Susan, depending on if you want to call it that, um, and then also blanket flower. These are annuals, and once you have them, they'll come back every year, at least so far they have for me, uh, and uh, so you want to manage those as well a little bit. And then if we get into some fall, more fall flowering plants, this one actually, the, the bee balm grows earlier in the spring. It's an annual. I put in a few. Now I have it every year. So I know I've got some uh, for the bees and the butterflies. And then blazing star. There are many species of blazing star. Stiff is our normal one around here. Uh, beautiful clusters of purple flowers in August through October. Uh, and it's just in my yard, it's just now getting ready to bloom. Goldenrods, the prairie goldenrod I would recommend, maybe not the altissima. I put it in here just so you can recognize it. This grows five, six feet tall, usually in tall grass prairie regions and where it's wet, wetter, a little bit moister. They get a little rank. These will grow in rocky soils, the prairie goldenrod, beautiful flowers. Uh, they do spread very well. They, they spread by seed very easily. Uh, they are perennials and I think really an attractive yellow flowering plant. And then if you really want to get crazy, there is 
this guy right here, Maximilian sunflower grows in our roadside ditches. Uh, by the way, if you squeeze the flower head, it smells like chocolate. Uh, but it gets very tall up to eight feet, but it attracts a lot of butterflies in September and October, including the monarch when it's migrating through. And then we have blue mist flower. These guys are great for butterflies. This is our native one that grows in more uh, where the soil is a little wetter, but I have been able to successfully grow that in my front yard, along with Greg's blue mist, which is the common one you're going to find. It has more divided leaves than the, the uh, kind of pointed leaves of the uh, blue mist flower. And then the other ones that are really, really valuable for monarch butterflies and fall migration, frostweed, which is a perennial, and cowpen daisy, which is an annual. This one in particular will attract every pollinator known to man. Uh, and it is a weedy plant, so you have to control it. It drops a lot of seeds. Each one of those little flowers in there can produce a seed and often does. Same thing for uh, uh, frostweed, fewer flowers, but very good at germinating new plants. So I've got this spreading in my yard a little bit and so far, okay, I can dig it out. But for attracting fall migrating monarchs, which are putting on fat as they come through Texas, these two plants are critical to their survival, overwintering survival in Mexico um, for our Texas migrants. Again, monarch butterflies, love them. And then I'm gonna uh, share with you this shrub that I love, shrubby bone set, um, native to the hill country. And when it starts blooming in, uh, it hasn't started blooming yet in my yard. I have two plants, three plants now. Um, every pollinator in God's green earth comes to it. And I will sit, literally sit in a chair outside of one of these plants for four to five hours at a time, photographing all kinds of butterflies and bees and wasps that nectar on this. So if you had one shrub you were gonna plant for fall flowering nectar and beauty, it would be shrubby bone set in my opinion. All right, we're getting close here. So this is my iNaturalist project. And I wanted to show you, this is as of today. I have documented three, at least, I think I've still got a few pictures of other things that aren't in here yet. 323 species of flowers. Now, again, a lot of the flowers I've brought in, but also birds, butterflies, everything else that have come to my yard. And that includes lizards, toads, frogs, um, uh, not so much for mammals, uh, but, but although I did, we did have a great, we have gray fox that come through and a few other things, um, but um, mostly butterflies and bees and things like that. So that's the project for me to track what's going on, okay? Now, the thing that uh, uh, I wanted to share with you, there are lots of resources. You can screenshot this. Uh, I am going to send this list to um, your host and she's gonna uh, get it out there for people to know about. Um, but there are all kinds of great books. The most recent one that everybody uh, loves is this book uh, called Nature's Best Hope by Doug Douglas Tallamy, who first wrote Bringing Nature Home. If you ever get a chance to listen to Doug Tallamy give a presentation, please do so. He is awesome. Uh, wonderful, wonderful guy uh, in terms of what he's doing out there uh, across the country, advocating for design, for creating habitat in your, at your home. Um, and then other books here, one that was put out by National Wildlife Federation, uh, author David Mizwiski, Jwiski, I'm going to say that wrong. And then a couple of new books by an author by the name of Heather Holm that's just fantastic resource books. But here's lots of things specific to Texas as well. So take advantage of those. Again, I'll share those uh, via email um, later. So anyway, there is my contact information. There's my email. If you have questions, there's my face or uh, iNaturalist page. Uh, Tanya, my colleague, there's her information as well. And if you have any questions, I've tried to cover a lot of information. I know it's 1034. We said we were going to be done at 1030, so I came close. Um, but if there are additional questions, I'm happy to answer those. So there's just one more I want to get out there. This is from Sharon. She wants to know if you can put in Mealy Blue Sage by seed. Um, you know, you. The answer would be, of course, yes. Um, collecting the seed when it's ripe is the tricky part. So if you find a patch of it, monitor it. When it's done flowering, what you might do, if you can, is put um, some kind of paper, probably not even paper, like a little mesh, fine mesh bag over the flower head and seal it. 
so that when the seeds are ripe and they naturally fall out, they'll fall into the bag. Um, I have, the other thing you can do is if you find some mealy blue sage is grab the flower heads and shake them out into a pan or something like that. Eventually a few flowers will come out or a few seeds may come out, but they drop their seed and it's hard to even know they're dropping their seeds. So that's why I say that little mesh bag around a, a plant where it was protected um, might allow you to collect the seeds a little bit better, so. All right, that, that was it. I mean, other than lots of thank yous and uh, amazing presentation. And uh, I appreciate everyone joining us this morning. And a special thanks to Craig, obviously, because it was awesome. And thanks, everyone, and hope you have an awesome day. And, you know, get those seeds in the refrigerator so you can have a beautiful yard like Craig has. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Take good care. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you, Paula. I hope that was uh, a decent program for you. Oh, that was awesome. That was really good. You can tell by the types of questions people were posting and everything. It was okay. really good. Uh, so when I get the recording, I will also send you um, the link to the, the link for it. Okay, cool. You cool. can send me the resources, then I can append that to the email when I send the recording out to everybody. I'll, I'll do that as soon as I get off this this morning so it's done and I don't forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, right. the, and I kind of measure um, how a presenter is relating with the audience and the fact that we had the same number of people on at the end that we had at the beginning. Good. That's a good sign. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. I hate it when I start seeing the number of people getting smaller because it's like, oh, wow, they don't like it. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it but was, you, never, you never know. So. It was really good. And I think a number of people commented on the fact that the before and after pictures were very helpful and yeah. kind of getting that storyline in for them. And it was very um, inspiring inspirational okay. yeah. to them to go and, and do some stuff themselves so awesome awesome very good glad to hear it so much. all right well you I bet you take me take good care yeah and you were going to send me the uh contact information yes. i'll do that as well i'll do that i'll do that same time Yay. okay all right thanks take so good much. care have a great weekend you too bye bye, -bye.